Una y dos. Y dos. Una y dos. Una y dos. Hello and welcome to Cortez NYC live stream, the podcast. This show broadcasts twice a week out of New York City. We are your hosts, Cortez NYC. And Carla de Puerto Rico. And on the show, we talk about art, creativity, city life. From a Latino perspective, I'm a visual artist. And I'm a singer. And this is episode 37, Cooking Up Some Styles. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. And also on social media on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. And don't forget, go on my online store, Cortez NYC. Dot bigcartel.com. There you can find all of my graffiti merchandise. I have graffiti pins, posters, and stickers. And I will be having a new launch, a part two to my launch, uh, August 1st. So I'll have new stuff available. Go on my online store and check it out. Stay and tuned. Shout out to all our friends on Instagram. Shout out to uh, Serimar Nicole. Thank you for the support. Peace. All right, cooking up some styles. Uh, I want to get back to some art talk here. We haven't had a really good art talk in a long time, Carla. About time. Yeah, it's about time. We're way past time. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it's been a while since I sat down and really said, let me do an art talk about some specific visual techniques. Uh, and I figured I'd go back to some graffiti talk. Um, For all of you who are not interested in graffiti, <laughs> buckle up, because it's going to be a long one for you guys. Well, maybe you can learn something from graffiti that you can incorporate into your art life. Exactly. And for all you graffiti artists out there, this is going to be like an advanced graffiti talk here, because I think this is something that you... I think the, the real graffiti aficionados, the real lettering experts are going to identify with some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um... It's hard to visualize this. I mean, this is a, a much more interesting conversation if you had visuals. Right. So I'm going to post some visuals for you guys to follow along uh, as you listen to this. I'm going to post it on the Instagram, Cortez NYC Instagram. Cortez NYC live stream Instagram. Live stream, yeah. Um, I'll post a couple of slides for you guys to understand what I'm talking about, what I'm describing. But I'm going to do my best in this conversation, this audio podcast, to describe exactly mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. So... The subject is wild style, graffiti wild style lettering. Um, I thought about how to break this down. I don't think a lot of people do this. Graffiti artists usually don't. They just kind of want to be free. They don't want to talk about any formal structure. Yeah. They, um, some graffiti artists, some of the traditionalists try to follow a traditional structure, mm -hmm. uh, like a New York style or an LA style. That's what they talk about. Or a, you know, European style, you know, they'll, they'll talk about a certain style of lettering. Um, usually it identifies a style of lettering that comes from like the 90s or the 80s, usually even the 80s, I would say, even before my time, where there was a certain type of tick talking to your letters, a certain type of 80s cartoony lettering with uh, arrows and a 3D kind of, you know, extensions and things like that. And that's a traditional style. And so there's, there are traditionalists that will stick to that. And there's a formula to describe that. What I'm going to do in this conversation is I am going to talk about what I've seen in my style um, for structure that also translates to what I've seen in other people's styles. Um, and I've narrowed it down to four structural elements, four styles of structure for my graffiti wild style pieces. Um, The number one style, the, the first one on my list is a typeset style. Uh, I describe this as an evenly spaced and distributed individual lettering style. So you're doing your piece, but you're separating your letters individually and evenly spacing them out. You're trying to keep them balanced so that it feels like it's typeset. You're, you're designing your, your font and it's a graffiti wild style lettering style, but but you're making sure that the letters are this, about the same size and you're making sure that you have an even amount of distribution of space between them. So that's my first layout concept is the typeset style um, where everything is even, right? I think that's a little more traditional. That's what people tend to strive for. 
Uh, the next type I call organic. And that's, I think, where I've experimented a lot more mm -hmm. um, because, the, to me, the typeset style is kind of traditional. For me, the organic style was what I brought in the 90s and a lot of graffiti artists started doing more in the 90s, which was I described the organic style as um, the piece as a whole object, looking at the piece as a whole object, not as individual letters. And the sizes and the shapes of all your letters within your, your, your word that you're writing, they kind of flow within each other. And if, let's say you started with a small letter, then the next letter will be a big letter, and then the next letter will be a stretched out letter, and then the next letter will be a taller letter. And you're gonna play with all the letters within the word organically and let them flow into each other almost like in a freestyle kind of way um but the point of it is that you're not you're taking the whole thing organically and making a, a big shape out of it out of all your letters instead of individually spacing them out like in the in the first one the typeset style the organic style looks at the whole silhouette of the graffiti piece and takes that into account more than each individual letter so Sometimes the people that like more of a typeset style will look at the organic style and say, well, you have no structure. You have right. no, you know, your lettering doesn't make sense because it, it doesn't follow, uh, you know, a, a, a set pattern. You mm -hmm. know, you look at the size of your letter E. Why is it so small compared to your letter S, mm -hmm, you know, or mm -hmm. something like that? Um, but I, I've realized that over the years, I've seen that it, it's a style. It's, it's an organic, I call it an organic style. Um, so that's number two for me, is organic style. The, the sizes and the shapes can vary, everything can flow, as long as the whole piece looks solid and it looks like it's all unified. Um, the next one I call a keystone style. Um, I've identified this because I've done it a few times. I don't do it often, this style, a keystone style of structure. But I have seen people do this. Uh, the keystone style is that you have a key letter within your piece. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a letter that maybe gives you a hard time, so then you make it the key letter. Or sometimes it's a letter that you enjoy the most. That like, uh, you know, let's say, um, I know Greed, sometimes he points out when he does his pieces, like the letter R he likes a lot because you can do a lot with the letter R. Yeah. It has so many legs and, and a circle and a, and a, a backside. And a, like he can do a lot with it. Um, some people like their letter S's. They're, they freak on their letter S's. Like they make their S really funky. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this letter is in the middle of their piece. Sometimes it's at the end, at the, in the beginning or at the end of the pieces. Point of the keystone style is that you're, you're picking out one letter and you're making that letter be the key element to the rest of your, of your letters. And it, and it kind of holds the rest of your letters together. Um, for me, sometimes it'll be the letter R, sometimes it'll be the letter T. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll maybe center all my letters around the letter T. Maybe I'll start to sketch and I'll work my letter T first and then I'll start building my letters around that. And it kind of forms this, it becomes the key to my, the rest of my piece. I, um, it informs the movement and the flow of the rest of my piece. Um, sometimes if uh, somebody, let's say, has a letter R and they want to like put a lot of crazy extensions, they'll make all the other letters connected to their to letter the, yeah. R um, so that that one letter happens to touch two or three other letters. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed that. I've just noticed that it's an observation that I've made about graffiti structure that over the years I've seen it and I said, you know what? That's a style. Like Some people might not like it. Um, you know who does that a lot is... Um, Organic styles and key style, uh, key letter styles, keystone styles. He mixes those things. Is Prox, hmm. my boy Prox. Prox mm -hmm. tends to do that a lot. He's got a lot of flow and a lot of organic shapes. That's true. Yeah. And when you look at his lettering, uh, sometimes his letter P will be yeah. really big, or his letter X. The X yeah, the last, it'll, yeah, it'll swoosh around, and maybe sometimes his X might be the key style. Yeah. You know, I haven't I haven't analyzed his pieces that way. But I, I've identified these things in it. I'm sure if I looked at his piece carefully, I would I would see these things in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think this this conversation for all you advanced graffiti artists out there, I know that there's been many conversations about you know 3D. You know 3D is a thing about lettering or, or arrows or bits. Those are things about graffiti lettering that is a, a, an element. I'm saying yes, that's a given. But what I'm talking about is your structure, your 
I don't know. I, I guess it's almost your style. It's almost right. it's, yeah. it's something more. You can still have arrows and bits. This is another part of the formula that you that you have to like. Yeah, it's like the structure. It's yeah. like the base. The base. So then you can do your arrows and everything yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and also how you lay out your your pieces, your your tag even. Hmm. It even goes into your into your sense of style of your name. You know when you when you put your piece on there and you put your name on there. Uh, by, by either picking one of these structural styles, you, you, you kind of animate your name and you give it that flavor that makes it yours. Um, more than just an arrow, more than, because we're all doing arrows. We're all doing 3Ds. We're yeah, all yeah. doing bits. Exactly. You know what I mean? Um, but okay, so the number three one was keystone. A keystone letter, a keystone style is that you pick a key letter and you make that letter the foundation of the rest of your piece. Um, as opposed to being organic and as opposed to being typeset, wh where you evenly space everything out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last style that I, I identified, which is a style that I've been experimenting with more in the past maybe three years or four, four years, is a style that I call archetype style. Um, archetype style is a technique where you design one wild styled letter, and then you take that letter almost like a like a template and you and it's a the art it becomes the archetype it becomes the uh the model for the rest of the letters and then you begin to create the rest of your letters imitating the same maybe the same sh overall shape or maybe if that one letter has a certain signature swoosh or a signature signature uh curve or a signature serif or something you take that and you carry that into the rest of your letters almost like a cookie cutter it it is a a version of the typeset style because you do try to evenly space out and evenly distribute le your letters mm -hmm. but it goes beyond the typeset style because now you're actually imitating making the rest of your letters out of that one archetype letter um in a, in a wild style way so it's not a font as opposed to a type font where mm -hmm. you are making a font like an you know like a, a, a computer would yeah yeah um fonts don't really imitate each other like uh the letter a in an alphabet doesn't look exactly like the letter b mm -hmm. doesn't look exactly like the letter k what i'm saying is that you're taking the shape of this abstracted letter mm -hmm. like a logo it's almost like taking a logo and then you're copying that logo over and over and over again and then making the, the next letter out of that abstracted shape and finding the letter within that shape. Um, archetype is something I've been experimenting with. I've seen people do it. I've seen artists do it. I would say some of the, the really intricate wild style masters, people who really do some really funky technical wild style, they will follow this technique. Cause you'll see that they, they try to imitate patterns and they almost like repeat certain um, they repeat certain motifs across all their lettering across the entire piece. And you'll see it repeating, repeating, so that you can't even read the letters. It just looks like a bunch of shapes that repeat. But when you look at it carefully, and if the artist points it out to you, you will see the, letters. the lettering that it's supposed to represent. Um, I, think it's a, I think for me, it's a more challenging style, especially on a wall. I've tried it on a wall. I've sketched them on, on paper and then translated it to a wall. It's challenging because more challenging than the other styles because you have to repeat these shapes and if you don't get the shapes right if you don't pay attention to the size and the width and the scale of of these repeating elements mm -hmm. it's going to look sloppy it's going to look like you're just making a mess it's not yeah. going to look it's not going to give that illusion of yeah, yeah. of a repeating echoing shape mm -hmm. um so for me it's challenging you know i i like i said i think the the fourth the second um I think the number two on my list, the organic style, is the one that I've experimented with the most because to me that was the most reflective of my personality on the wall, which is freestyling and organic and interconnecting and all that. Right. Um, so I think the fourth type, archetype, that's the type that to me is the biggest challenge that I've taken on in this last couple of years to, um, to kind of raise my awareness of how to make a piece and how to make it... Um, more challenging, yeah. more more exciting for me, you know, more yeah. of a of a puzzle. Um, all right, and then um, so th those are the four 
categories, the four structural styles for graffiti wild styles that I would identify. Typeset, organic, keystone, and archetype. Um, then I wanted to go quickly over some of the steps that I follow to make a wild style. So let's say you pick, you pick this one of these structures and you say, okay, I want, now I wanna make my wild style piece, what do I do? Um, I, broke the, I broke it down to a couple of steps. Um, I, I got seven steps on building your wild style piece. Number one, I would say, when you get to a, a, a wall or a piece of paper, let's, let's say a piece of paper, because you're gonna sketch in a, in a book. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing you should do is you, you should decide the overall shape. And I think this is where you, where you choose your type. You decide what is the overall shape. Is it circular? Is it rectangular? Is it more tall? Is it more square? So you kind of like give yourself a rough uh, box of where more or less you're gonna put, what kind of shape is your piece gonna have, right? Then you take your piece and you divide it into the letters that you're gonna need. So if my name has, Cortez has six letters, I divide the, this shape into six. I'm not gonna say a box into right. shape, because I don't know what the shape's gonna be. Right, right, right. But I divide it kind of into six. I can start, once I have it divided into six, then I can start to push and pull and say, well, you know what? I want it to be a little funkier. I'm gonna make my first division smaller, my second division bigger. You can start to realize consciously how you're beginning to push your letters and to extend your letters. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't want it to be perfectly even. So you make your divisions uneven. Uh, maybe you don't care. So you just kind of like give yourself some fast divisions, chop, 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 and, you, and they're sloppy and you don't really care how even they are. Right. Which is the way I've usually done it. <laughs> um, uh, step number three would be to lightly write out your letters in a single line sketch. Uh, a lot of graffiti artists do this. You'll see graffiti artists do this. Um, they'll almost take a tag onto the piece of paper. Um, either they'll do it by taking a tag or they'll just run their hand across the paper pretending to take the tag, but they're already kind of mapping out how much space they have to fill in their letters. Um, I know Mears has been experimenting with that now. He's got a new technique now, a new style that he's been doing on canvas and on walls where he's taking his his lined tags and he's like converting them into abstract pieces. It's pretty yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting to look at. The final product is very interesting to look yeah. at because he's make, he's taking tags and just kind of overlapping them and then cre making finding shapes within those shapes that overlap. Um, and you can kind of feel his graffiti hand feel uh -huh. in, in it. Uh -huh. You see the lines that he likes to use. Yeah, so it, it doesn't look like just an abstract piece with a bunch, a bunch of lines all over. That doesn't make sense. You can actually look at the like transition of, of the letters yeah. throughout the canvas. Um, so lightly write out the letters in a single line to to kind of like sketch out your tag on top of this shape and within this space that you're going to be using. Um, the next one is, I would say the next step number four would be pick out your shapes. So once you have your little tag and your little lightly shaped, light, lightly sketched boxes and your little lightly sketched area, start to pick out where, the, what are the shapes that you're going to do? Your lettering. You can base your lettering off of your tag or if you want to do some typeset style, maybe you can invent a graffiti lettering style and then you start to carefully build it that way. But if you just want to be a little more free and organic, you can just use your tag as a foundation and start to flesh out the letters based on your thin line tag. Um, but I think when you start to pick out your shapes, you should look at the lines that you did in your tag because those lines are unique, the, the lines of your, of your tag sketch and you should try to identify which are the lines that you like and which are the ones that you want to keep from that. Um, that'll make your graffiti piece wild and, and alive and have movement. Um, so pick out your shapes. Acknowledge that everybody's style is different, so don't be a stickler and be like, no, they have to look a certain way. Like, just go with what you're doing. It's all right, it's, ab it's abstract, it's wild style. It doesn't have to look like anything other than your own handwriting. Um, and then I would say the next step, number five, is balance the thickness and the forms of the letters. Once you've already identified and you started sketching out your lettering, start to now mold the lettering. Kind of give it a little bit of structure. Try to say, okay, the, you know, because lettering should have some formula to, to the structure. Start to say, well, 
the, the bars within my letters, the, the, the strokes of my letters should be a certain thickness so that people can follow, their eye can travel across the piece and follow the thickness of the letters to make out the letters a little bit. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make the letters so different, each one, that you can't make it out at all. Like yeah. You want to at least give people a clue. So this is where you kind of start to f choose a weight to your, to your lettering. And then go, you can go maybe a little thicker on some and a little thinner on some as long as they average out to something that, that relates to each other. That will help. Um, and then the forms of the letters, like the letter S. After you've sketched this out, does it look like a letter S? Judge it, erase a little bit, fix it a little bit if it looks a little off. Uh, if you did a letter X and it just looks bananas, it looks crazy, you know, judge it, judge it after you've done this, judge it and say, okay, does the, does the form look okay or should I just push it a little bit so people can see it a little clearer? You know, sometimes the abstractions can go too abstract and you want to give it a little form. So this is a step that I'm telling you to just pull back a little bit and make sure you can still read the, the words. Um, and then number six, I would say after you've done all of this, you've sketched your letters, you have the forms, you have your shapes, you've, you've figured out the structure of it and you've kind of made them balanced, you can add your bits, your connections, your extensions, your arrows. This is after you've already made your piece look good without it. Mm -hmm. So you've gone along these steps, you got a good looking piece, it looks comfortable, it looks nice. Now you can add, if you feel that you need it, some extensions that connect maybe letters together or go behind letters or go in front of letters. You can add little bits, um, like what we call bits is like little, um, just little fragments of letters that kind of fall off of the lettering. Um, or maybe sit in front of the lettering, mm -hmm. almost like little tile pieces. Um, and I, that, that peop people do that to kind of like give it a little more animation, almost like a, like a quotation marks yeah. or commas. Yeah. They're just like little accents to your letters to, to bring them to life, give them a little bounce. Um, and then lastly, I would say the last step is just add your 3D if you, or, or a shadow, or drop shadows if you think you need it, usually, uh, or, or a heavier outline to your whole silhouette if you want to do that usually people do that because at the end of it they want to give it a little more weight you know sometimes the graffiti pieces look a little thin they look a little light so they want to make them a little heavier that's when you add your 3d or you add your drop shadows and things like that um this these steps are steps that i'm kind of formula formulating now just to kind of give you guys <laughs> an idea of what goes on through my head this is not something that i sit step by step uh, and, and follow every single piece that I do. But I think I do follow these steps unconsciously. Yeah, yeah this is not in a book, but it could be in a book. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but, but I, think, I think it's the kind of thing like a recipe we're, we're yeah. going to talk about later, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you hand down recipes from one generation to the next. Exactly. You know, you discover something, how to cook up some styles, and you figure out the recipe the formula for it exactly and there's no books on this there's nothing on this and you say to yourself okay i'll pass on this information and maybe it'll make sense to the next person to some people listening right now this might not make any sense <laughs> but there will be that one or two people out there that are going to hear this and say yeah i followed that conversation perfectly i got exactly what it was talking about i do the same thing and now it's a thing now exactly now somebody put it into words now it's a, a recipe you know um, and now it can be worked on. It can be built on top of, you know. I think that's what we do with recipes, right? And, and also, you know, cookbooks and all these things. There's cookbooks, there's, there's recipes and all that. But when you go to cook, the recipes are in your head, right? Yeah, and then exactly. you start experimenting. You start to play around with them and you kind of freestyle it, you know, night after night when you're cooking. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing on a wall. You know, we have recipes in our heads. We have some formulas that we know work. But it, uh, why do we keep going to paint is because, or going to sketch is because we know that we want to keep working with the recipe and kind of come up with something new, come up with something flavorful, something interesting. Um, and we keep reinventing the, uh, the recipes. Um, I was talking to Greedy about this and Greedy, you know, Greedy's a doctor of, uh, he's a chiropractor. Mm -hmm. So he was making a point that graffiti, in his eyes, he sees wild style as, a, as, a, as an organism. <laughs> you know, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of elements working together to help the whole, you know, like the <laughs> whole element.
kind of like the body's an organism yeah, and it's got yeah, made yeah. up of different parts and they yeah. all work together <laughs> uh, which is it's just a funny way to see it he was also talking about um he was talking about kinetics uh the kinetics the kinesis the kine- kin- kinesis the kinesis of the pieces that the pieces should have movement the same way that the body has movement to mm-hmm. be healthy mm-hmm. that the graffiti pieces should have movement if they don't have movement they look dead they look stale <laughs> and it, you know like hearing him say that is hilarious but it's like a different way of seeing it and i totally understood it i was yeah, like i yeah. got you 100 percent. yeah shout out to dr greedy thank you for that uh those notes i'm gonna add those to my uh i'm gonna add his notes to his to this post all right you guys go practice get your styles together Culture talk, Carla. Yes, culture talk. What are we going to talk about this culture talk, Carla? So, we're going to be talking about cooking. Cooking? Because this episode is all about cooking, recipes, cooking up some styles. And now we're going to be talking about actual cooking. (laughs) All right. Um, I like cooking and I like eating. Yeah. Do you think... Do you think that chefs have to like eating? In other words, do you... Because I notice chefs are always tasting their own food. Exactly, yeah. And not every chef, but a lot of chefs are like a little bit heavy. Yeah. (laughs) There's an assumption. (laughs) I don't know if it's a stereotype, but do you think that chefs also have to enjoy eating? In other words, preparing food and eating the food go hand in hand? Yeah, I think so. I think that if you don't like to eat then why are you cooking? <laughs> because part of what we're going to be talking about this is that cooking gives you some kind of independency. So if you like to eat and you need to eat, you need to learn how to cook. It's okay. like it goes hand by hand. Like I mean, I I would say, we're going to talk about it more right now, but I would say for, for myself, I like to eat more than I like to cook. Yeah. And I'll eat anything. Yeah. As long as it's somewhat decent. Like and like Actually, has it, but but I can identify when 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 food is good, mm-hmm. that'll it, it'll knock me down. Yeah. Like yeah. it'll take over my senses, right? Yeah. But for the most part I I when I cook, I cook just for survival. Exactly. But you but you got a point though. Because sometimes I feel and this is for me too, like chefs and people that like to cook, sometimes they cook because they like it that way like they like certain foods okay all right yeah, cooked could, that yeah. way and gotcha. that's what happens with me sometimes i want to eat something but i want it to taste the way i'm thinking about it in my mind gotcha so i want to cook it because i want to eat it like this and maybe that's what happened with chefs um sometimes but other times i've seen a lot of tv shows and cooking shows where the chefs they just want to prepare good food for people right it's not for themselves right so there's a lot of things going on but i wanted to start this conversation about cooking with uh seeing cooking as part of a ritual or a thing that uh, a tradition that is passed from generation to generation because i feel like cooking and learning how to cook and learning recipes is part of conserving a culture. I feel like uh, with recipes and with ingredients and with tools that started, let's say, in my grandmother's generation and that now I can still continue to do it, is part of preserving a culture and is part of preserving traditions that maybe I didn't even knew it existed and it's just part of my life now because she passed those traditions to me so i think that's a nice way to see cooking and connecting it with culture and connecting it with all the world because i feel like in in the whole world cooking and food is very important uh in the aspects of family but also uh, friends and socially food is like the center of all of all social events 
Yeah. If you go to an event and there's no food. Oh yeah, no. You're like. You're not doing anything. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> no, it's it's true. And and I think also what you what you just talked about with the the tools, um, mm -hmm. being part of the ritual and being part of the handing it down and how it it informs the culture. I would even, because I'm sure some people out there are like tools. What are you talking about? Like with like pots and pans. We all use pots and pans. Yeah. No. No. But I'll... but but mm -hmm. but there is even in the most basic form even here in american culture modern american culture how many of you people use a blender right for a time period for a time period a blender is, was everything right that was a new tool and people were just using the blender for everything like right. all the recipes involve blenders yeah how many of you people out there use let's say um now it's food processors exactly yeah you know or or let's say a, a, a let's say a microwave exactly you know, a microwave. Like, we have a microwave here in the house, but we don't really use it. Mm -hmm. But other people live by it. Mm -hmm. And it's because they were taught or maybe they grew up using microwaves and it just becomes part of their ritual, their culture of how they prepare food for whatever step of it. It might just be to defrost food or it might be to reheat food or it might be to prepare something quickly. Yeah, yeah. Heat something up while cooking something else up. Um, and then there's other tools, obviously, like the... the um, if you're going to get into baking, if you're going to get into... Yeah, exactly. You know, other things, different pots and, and things having to do with stoves and all that like when you watch these cooking shows and you see all the tools that they use you realize how many tools are accessible and then some of these new tools that i've never even seen yeah that they use yeah that i'm like wow like if i had that in my house we would start using it exactly. and it would become part of what we use if we found a use you know yeah um and then you're i'm sure you're going to talk about some some tools specifically yeah so um when i was little i think the first thing i learned to do in the kitchen back in puerto rico was to marinate meat and to marinate uh, pork chops and chicken and stuff like that and for me it was fun because the way that my grandmother do it uh, did it and the way she taught me how to do it it was like a fun thing to do and it was even relaxing at that time and I was little. So the way we'll do it, we'll take like some uh, garlic cloves. Cloves. Garlic cloves, um, some salt, a little bit of oregano. And we'll put all that in like a masher that we have in Puerto Rico that is called apilón. We'll put that there and mash everything together and then we'll create like kind of like a mix for marinating to use as a marinade for the meat. Right, I I I can see I can taste the difference when you do it when you marinate meat. Yeah, yeah. Like and you and you put all the fresh stuff in there and then you marinate it overnight compared to when we're in a rush and we just defrost meat quickly. And spice we just it. put powder. Yeah, we just put powder spice all on top powder and that's on it. it. Yeah. Yeah, I can totally tell the difference. Yeah. It's an extra little luxury to yeah, have that yeah, yeah. and it takes it takes more work i mean i know it takes work i've seen you do it and it, it takes work but yeah if you want to impress somebody or if you want that for yourself that extra flavor it's worth it yeah and and the it's most important savory. thing it, is it, that you're saying that it's a luxury and my mother and my grandmother they used to make it like every night <laughs> every night that's the way you marinate your meats and you have it they keep it ready for the next day so when i was growing up when i was getting a little bit um uh bigger older um they started teaching me how to do it because they didn't have enough time to do it themselves so that's how i learned to to marinate meat and that's and that's one of the things that basically i that i still do and that it was passed from generation to generation and then when i came to new york i became more familiar with the kitchen obviously because i needed to do it for myself for my family and it's really a, a relaxing experience once you have your ingredients and if you don't know a recipe maybe look it up and then you look up different re uh, different styles of the same recipe and you create your own it's really cool and it's it's an experience that is unique for each person but i feel like it's also rewarding when you create this recipe and then you give it to your family and they're like oh my god this is so good and then you taste it yourself and you're like oh yeah this is so good and you did it it's 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 a different experience than going to a restaurant and somebody do it for you so i think that's why cooking is so important and more in latino communities where food is everything 
we like to greet people we like to be prepared for anybody that comes to our house so giving them our food is almost like a sign of respect is a sign of love yeah. so yeah and yeah, we were walking around w walking around bushwick yeah this weekend we were walking from a from a, we were in brooklyn we were walking from a graffiti wall to another graffiti wall and, and we were going through bushwick and we were seeing how the neighborhoods change when you go from one neighborhood to another mm -hmm. and you can see that in the in the more spanish neighborhoods the more um where the, the stores are more bodegas and the people ha are hanging out outside on the stoops and it's obviously more Spanish, mm -hmm. you can see supermarkets. Exactly. There's supermarkets, huge supermarkets, yeah. real markets with real sales and everything, like really bulk food, uh, you know, on every other corner. Exactly. And then when you get to the more hipster areas, it's lounges and restaurants. And cafes. And cafes and, and all these things. And I'm like, cafes. Who's got... You know what I mean? Like you can see the difference in culture, in the mentality of like the the Latin communities will buy food in bulk and make their own restaurant, their own lounge, their exactly. own cafe at home. Yeah. Where they invite people over and they cook and they yeah. make their own food, they prepare their own food. While the other type of culture is now let's go out and mm -hmm. socialize outside and meet people outside and and have somebody prepare the food for us. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a luxury if you have that kind of money. That's great. But I think it's not just the luxury factor. I think it's also the factor of what you're about to describe, which is the ritual of sharing the cooking and preparing the food and, you know, yeah, exactly. being part of the preparation process. Exactly. Yeah. And it is a ritual because it, it was part of the daily life. So part of being in a Latino community more um in my case in puerto rico it was coming from school your mom was cooking rice beans the chicken and the tostones and maybe you will help her with the tostones to match the tostones or whatever and then everybody will eat but it was something that it was prepared by that special someone in your house and we take it for granted obviously because we are just eating and well yeah she has to cook because <laughs> i have to eat and we all have to eat but if you think about it it's a really nice and special way to see the importance of cooking and then how it translates to us as sons daughters children and then when we grow up we we actually see the connection there the connection in food Yeah, my father, he taught me to cook some basic things, and that's why I have that basic survival style of cooking. <laughs> Rice, potatoes, you know. I, back then, it was even frozen vegetables. Yeah. That was his thing, frozen vegetables. He just bought the frozen vegetables, pulled, pulled them out, showed me how to, you know, just put them in the hot water, let it boil, and now you got frozen. I remember when I got here, you used to buy the frozen corn yeah. and the frozen, yeah, like, yeah. green beans. And I and I stopped, you, I stopped doing it because I... I <laughs> You know, I realized like that was just really something that I learned as a shortcut, but it's not really yeah. something that I really like. So, you know, I think, yeah, we learn from what we're taught and, you know, I'm grateful for what he taught me because it helped me survive. I think that was his whole point. Exactly. Um, many years where I cooked for myself, you know, it helped me survive. But it also, I think, showed me appreciation when I do see somebody who really puts a lot of effort with recipes and everything to invent something magical in the kitchen. You know, I, I can respect that. Like, wow, that's now I really see what it takes. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. And these cooking shows, right? <laughs> <laughs> Those cooking shows. Yeah. <laughs> well, you wanted me to teach you, right? Street reality. Hablando español, Carla. Yes, hablando español. What are we going to talk about? What words what? are we going to use? Okay, so how do you say styles? styles is um estilos yes okay estilos styles how do you say letters letters is letras yes how do you say describe describe or description describe Well, description is descripción, mm -hmm. but describe... To describe. To describe is... Des describe? Yeah, or describir. Des describir. Mm -hmm. Describir or describe. Okay. Yeah. Describe. 
next one is yes yes tradition <laughs> traditionalist what <laughs> traditionalist traditionalist do you use that word to describe people that believe in traditions or oh, traditionalist all right yeah uh well tradition traditional is tradicional traditionalist is tradicionalistas tradicionalistas tradicionalista tradicionalista okay yes damn <laughs> <laughs> next one is organic 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 is orgánico yes come on man next one is silhouette silhouette is silueta yes come on carla challenge me next one is name what <laughs> name come on this is spanish 101 name yeah nombre okay good <laughs> next one is yes. structure structure okay that's a little more that's a little more advanced structure structure is structura estructura Estru estructura 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 yes. Estru estructura estructura all right yeah. that one see that's a little more advanced there you got me so you gave me a really easy one to throw me off and then you gave me a hard one yeah yeah all right so st structure is estructura yeah got it next one is pattern pattern i think we said this one time patron yes it is patron no there's another one. Oh, it's it's almost like like design diseño pattern pattern so pattern could be patron or it could be diseño yeah all right uh next one abstract abstract is abstracto yes uh next one accents what accent 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 acento 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 i gotta th remove the ac <laughs> so accent is acento yes uh, next one recipe recipe receta then tools tools um i think we said this one herramienta but then we said it wasn't herramienta we said it was instrumentos instrumentos <laughs> And the last, the last one, cooking. Oh, cooking. Well, no, two more. Cooking. Okay, so the next one is cooking. Cooking is co cocinar. Yes. Cocinando. Cocinando, Co cocinando. It's cooking. And the last one, kitchen. Kitchen. How do you say kitchen? Kitchen. <laughs> Kitchen. Kitchen is cocina. I think, I think we've said this one already. Yes. Cocina. Yes. Because I remember saying that cocina throws me off sometimes. Okay, I got one for you. This is a little bit advanced. So when I was talking about the graffiti pieces, I was talking about evenly distributed letters. How do you say evenly distributed? Uh, if I wanted to say, I want this to be evenly distributed. It should be uh, distribuir equitativamente or... Equi equitativamente. Equitativamente. I, or, I don't think I've ever used that word. Equitativ no, Equ that's very colegio. That's advanced. Yeah. Equitativamente or uniformemente. The thing is that I feel like the word uniformemente has to do more with forms and the way that they're attached but equitativamente has to do more with distributing and and that is equal e parts equal parts yeah well i mean that's what it is when i say evenly yeah i mean that they balance out even yeah you know two for two you know what i mean two plus two equals four like very yeah, even yeah. division um so i yeah e e equitativamente Equitativamente. Destru distribuir equitativamente. Distribuir equit equit equitativamente. 
<laughs> Evenly distributed. Love it. All right, I learned something. That was tough. I wanted yeah, to go advanced. Yeah, yeah. I said, let's go advanced. All right, thank you, Carla. All right, another episode in the bag. Woohoo! Uh, next episode is episode 38 characters yes and i'm going to be talking about an art life about drawing characters i've been getting into characters lately again sketching i'm filling up a new book with a bunch of characters so i'll be talking about how i go about inventing characters and what i like when i invent characters and on culture talk i'm gonna be talking about friendship we're gonna be talking about our the friends in our life and how they're so important for us all right and then at the end hablando español oh yeah